Thank you, Mary, uh, for the introduction, uh, and thanks uh, to all for the invitation and for your time and attention. As uh, Mary said, I'm going to set the stage with some points about policy, particularly the President's climate action plan and its implications, and Tim and Doug will then talk more specifically about uh, technologies. Uh, next slide, please. Let me uh, step back for a moment to put this in, uh, in context. Uh, up until now, we've had two stages of the climate change debate. Uh, and I, 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 they really are two different versions of gridlock. First, in 2009-2010, was the legislative stage, Waxman-Markey, uh, which, as you recall, passed the House and uh, fell short in the Senate. In 2011 until now, we've had uh, a period in which there's been no legislation. The administration, after uh, the Republican takeover of the House, really decided to forego major legislative proposals. You've had EPA regulations and a, and a reaction or backlash on Capitol Hill. You've had an ongoing review of the renewable fuel standard. There's been uh, the ongoing operation of the various uh, grant and loan programs, and then, again, a political reaction. and Largely as part of tax reform, there's been a review of tax incentive proposals. But as I, as I say, it's really two different versions of gridlock. Next slide, please. Now we're moving to a new stage. As you know, on June 25th, the president proposed a surprisingly aggressive climate change plan in a speech at Georgetown University. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. The president continues to forego legislation and focus instead on uh, the exercise of executive power. The plan, which is in its basic form about 21 pages, proposes over 30 policy proposals around three main objectives. The first is to cut carbon emissions. And then the first, of course, is the, the most controversial in, in several ways. The second is to promote adaptation to uh, coming climate change through various uh, types of resiliency. And the third is for the U.S. to lead international climate change negotiations in various forums. Next slide, please. Before turning to the uh, details, I'll just say a couple of things about the political reaction. Uh, it's been predictable and intense. You've had Senator Reid, majority leader, endorsing it, and then you've had Speaker Boehner calling it essentially a national energy tax, and even a Democrat uh, from a coal state, Senator Manchin, saying that it uh, embodies a war on coal. So. The speech doesn't herald a sudden turn to bipartisanship. Instead, uh, this is uh, the consideration of the president's plan is likely to be contested politically virtually every step of the way, whether through hearings, appropriations, riders, invocation of the, Congress the Congressional Review Act, or uh, other, other means. Next slide, please. Now let's turn to two particularly important aspects of the plan. First, the clean air regulations, and second, relevant funding proposals. The president, uh, last year, on April 13th, EPA published a notice of proposed rulemaking regarding carbon emissions from new power plants. In his action plan speech and in an accompanying memorandum, the president directed EPA to propose a new rule by September 20th of this year. And our understanding is that on July 2nd, EPA sent that proposed rule to OMB for it to be cleared uh, for uh, publication. We're not sure when it'll be published, but we expect it'll be sometime in September. In addition, with respect to existing power plants, in his speech, the president 
uh, and the memo, the President directed EPA to propose regulations for existing sources by June 1st, 2014, and final regulations by June 1st, 2015. Next slide, please. With respect to funding, one of the uh, proposals in the president, President's plan was to significantly increase funding for clean energy across various agencies, and in particular, to uh, issue a solicitation for as much as $8 billion in loan guarantee authority for the development of technologies that can avoid, reduce, or sequester anthropogenic emissions of GHGs. So those are the two main proposals, the Clean Air Act regulatory proposals and the funding proposal. There are many more, but those are the two I'd like to concentrate on uh, and discuss the implications of. Next slide, please. So what are the implications? First, the Clean Air Act regulations. The proposed regulation of carbon emissions will create market demand for new technology. That is, the president is going to, EPA is going to propose significant and potentially aggressive new standards for power plants, both for new power plants and in a year's time for existing power plants. Uh, this regulatory process under the Clean Air Act is going to be an extensive process with a lot of proposals and then feedback through the regulatory process as well as meetings with EPA in order to determine the technologies that will underlie the ultimate emission standards. That is, EPA is going to have to determine the appropriate technology to achieve uh, emission standards. As part of that, and I should note, in some cases, the uh, regulations will be implement, implemented in uh, partnership with the states, particularly for existing power plants. So EPA is going to be determining what technologies are available in order to meet the standards. And that's potentially where, bio, where algae comes in. Uh, and uh, various uh, ways, beneficial reuse, and other forms of technology that can complement um, utility technologies in order to achieve uh, CO2 reductions. I'll note, uh, in 2010, as part of the uh, proposed rule that was issued earlier, the one that really was superseded by the President's um, uh, speech on June 25th and by the upcoming regulation, uh, in, in 2010, EPA uh, issued uh, something called the Available and, Emerg Available and Emerging Technologies for Reducing Greenhouse Gas Emissions from Coal-Fired Electric Generating Units. It's a pretty good paper. goes through sequestration, various forms, and other, other uh, capture technologies. It's 46 pages long, uh, and I haven't read it uh, closely. I looked at it this morning. I didn't read it in detail this morning, but I did uh, do a universal search for the word algae, and it doesn't come up, uh, nor does biological sequestration, beneficial reuse, etc. So when EPA is thinking about technologies that can be used, it's not clear to me that it's thinking uh, about the full range of technologies that are available. So there are two issues. One is making sure that as part of the policy process, the, con the consideration of uh, these various regulations, both by EPA and ultimately by states implementing them on the ground, that they're thinking about CO2 strategies that involve algae and uh, other uh, biological applications. Second, of course, going forward with the technology. So first, the policy process. Second, technologies that can take advantage of the opportunity. Second set of implications is fairly obvious, and that is funding opportunities under, uh, uh, under the um, Section 1703 and other appropriate grant programs. Here again, the administration talks about taking creative approaches, using flexibility, using um, advanced technologies uh, in order to reduce CO2 emissions. It's not clear that they've focused as part of this process on the uh, opportunity that is available from uh, algae and other 
forms of beneficial reuse, biological sequestration, etc. If, if you read the basics of the plan, it looks like they're thinking mainly about sequestration and such. So again, here, there's an opportunity at the policy level for education to make sure that they understand the whole range of options that should be made available, and second, developing the technology to take advantage of it. So first, the regulatory process, these new clean air regulations, do they create opportunities in this field? And if so, what technologies can best take advantage of it? Second, funding opportunities. Third, and I'll just make this, raise this really as a question, and that is vehicle efficiency standards, particularly for, uh, for trucks. The president indicates that uh, he's going to move forward here as well. Uh, and without having studied the CAFE standards uh, uh, application to um, uh, algae uh, in any detail, it, it seems to me that if we're moving forward with vehicle efficiency standards, CAFE standards, if you will, that now are focusing principally on CO2 reduction rather than the reduction in, in classical pol conventional pollutants, is there a role, for example, with respect to credits or what have you for uh, beneficial reuse, biological sequestration, etc. That is, can that in some way be taken into account? I think that that probably would be breaking new ground in that process, but it might be worth giving some thought to. Those are some thoughts about about the uh, about the policy process. There will be two main opportunities to sum up. One in the, on the regulatory side with respect to these major new clean air regula regulations, and second on the regulatory side, as we, I'm sorry, on the funding side, as the process goes forward, there'll be a lot of feedback. As I said, this, this is not going to be an easy road politically. There'll be hearings, there'll be pushback, there'll be uh, political reactions, but at the same time, there are likely to be many, many new opportunities. With that, I'll turn it back. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I know that several attendees listening today have already had questions, and we will get to those questions um, during the Q&A answer session at the end of the webinar. Just as a reminder, you can submit your questions um, at any time in the chat window. Um, I know on my screen it's in the lower right-hand corner um, and on the go to webinar control panel. Now I'd like to just jump right into our next panelist. Doug Durst is a senior project manager in emerging technology for Duke Energy. In this role, he is responsible for assessing and selecting new and emerging, genera new and emerging generation related technologies for further de development and deployment. Doug has 27 years of experience in the energy industry. Previously, he served as a resource planning consultant, and prior to the merger of Duke Energy and Synergy in April 2006, he served as a senior energy for Synergy. Duke Energy, as many of you know, um, is the largest electric power holding company in the United States, serving approximately 7.2 million customers across the Southeast and the Midwest. Its commercial power and international business segments own and operate diverse power generation assets in North America and Latin America, including a growing portfolio of renewable energy assets in the United States. Doug, I think the screen controls have been switched over to you. Um, and we are very eager to hear about your project. You have it here. Thank you, Mary. I'm going to be covering the carbon capture utilization technologies and sequestration. Duke Energy operates in six states in the Midwest and Southeast. And as Mary indicated, we're the largest utility in the United States, the second largest emitter of carbon dioxide. We produced about 125 million tons of CO2 every year. From the pie charts on the bottom right hand corner you can see we're shifting our generation from coal to more natural gas. Natural gas produces half the amount of carbon emissions compared to coal, but still over 60 percent of our generation is coming from uh, fossil fuels. So if we want to maintain this diversity, diversified generation mix, we need to find a solution on being able to capture the carbon and make a good use of it. Duke's strategy is to uh, modernize our generation fleet. And one example of that is Sutton Station, where we're retiring uh, three older unscrubbed coal fire units and installing a combined cycle natural gas unit. 
This will be online later this year. Edwardsport Station came online last month. It's the largest integrated gasification combined cycle plant in the world. It is the cleanest form of coal generation. The way the technology works is you gasify the coal, then you remove the impurities, and then burn the resulting synthetic fuel. We have also left space and designed this plant so we can add carbon and capture later. Cliffside 6 came online last year. It's a supercritical coal-fired unit. And as you can see from the graphic in the bottom right-hand corner between the boiler and the stack, utilities are pretty comfortable with adding post-combustion environmental equipment to meet regulations. The bar chart on the left shows the Duke Energy Carolina units from most efficient being on the left, the black bar there representing uh, cliffside six. And as you move to the right, those are your more older, less efficient units. So the strategy of retiring older units that are 50, 60 years old with newer units, better technology, more efficient and cleaner uh, is a good strategy as work for Duke. Duke Energy is also the largest regulated nuclear generation fleet in North Carolina and South Carolina, we have 11 units there. Our 12th unit, Crystal River in Florida, was uh, just recently retired this year. But this nuclear generation that has zero carbon emissions, uh, when you average in that in with the rest of our generation mix, uh, that helps lower our CO2 emissions per megawatt hour. Carbon capture technologies, uh, there's three main types, post-combustion, which uh, was like cliffside I mentioned there, pre-combustion, like the Edwardsport IGCC, and oxy-fuel combustion. The U.S. government is doing a project in Illinois called Future Gen 2. The way the technology works is you have an air separation unit that pulls the oxygen out of the air, you combust the coal in a pure oxygen atmosphere, and you create a high concentration of CO2 on the output which should be a, a lower cost method to capture the carbon. So once you've captured the carbon, what do you do with it? Here's the project that we did in, at our East Bend station in northern Kentucky where we injected the carbon back underground. This is a project that was done with the Midwest Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnership. You can also utilize the uh, CO2. Utilities have been focused on enhanced oil recovery. We're looking at that as an opportunity to have revenues coming in to help offset the cost of carbon capture and sequestration. We're also working with a Chinese company that uh, captures their carbon from a coal fire plant and they take the CO2 and sell it to a beverage company to uh, carbonate drinks. And Duke Energy is also cultivating algae to see what kind of beneficial byproducts we can make uh, from algae using our flue gas as the CO2 source. In 2009, the U.S. and China signed an agreement to work on common issue problems, one issue being uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, the two countries are bringing in their universities, national labs, and industry partners to work together to solve these issues, and, and Duke Energy has joined in on that partnership. One of the projects is at Duke Energy's East Bend station on the left, where we're cultivating algae there. And our partners are ENN from China and the University of Kentucky. In 2010, ENN provided the mobile algae unit in the top right-hand corner, uh, with that unit, we were able to test different algae strains, try different water sources from around the plant, and also compare um, CO2 from flue gas and pure CO2. And from the testing, we found that the algae grew just as well or even better with the flue gas as the CO2 source. So now we've scaled the project up. Uh, now we are using the University of Kentucky's photobioreactor design at East Bend Station. Uh, this picture was taken back in December when we had one half of a module built. The picture in the top right-hand corner 
shows uh, the picture from last month shows that we've built another half. So now we have a full uh, module built. We've also poured the foundation to add two more modules on. So we've extended another 40 feet. And the artist rendering in the bottom left-hand corner gives you an idea of what that final uh, project's going to look at look like later this year. Mary, that's all I have right now, and I turn it back over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Doug. Um, that was actually fascinating. I loved seeing your photography and um, the build-outs that you're doing um, on this, what we consider to be an extremely important project. Our third panelist today is Tim Burns, President and CEO of Bioprocess Algae. Bioprocess Algae is based in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, and is currently running a demonstration plant at the Green Plains Renewable Energy Ethanol Plant in Shenandoah, Iowa. I will have to mention, I had the joy of being at the grand opening of that plant with Secretary Vilsack um, of the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, the bioreactors installed in Shenandoah are tied directly into the ethanol plant's CO2 exhaust gas and have been operating continu continuously since the October of 2009. Tim has more than 25 years of experience in the development, treatment, and filtration of of industrial, excuse me, industrial organic and organic wastewaters using advanced technologies. He previously founded three successful wastewater companies, the most recent being Bioprocess H2O. Bioprocess Algae is one of the leading members of the algae biomass organization that are using CO2 emissions in, an al in algae cultivation. So Tim, um, we're turning the controls over to you and you can start it at any time. Tim, you may have to unmute yourself. If everyone will bear with us in, for just a couple of moments, um, we're just checking to see what our technical difficulty might be. So if you would just be so patient. Well, while we are waiting for um, us to work through the technical difficulties, why don't I turn, um, ask a couple of the questions that have come in um, in the meantime, and we can hopefully get these, um, these questions um, answered now while we're working through some of these technical difficulties. Um, the first one actually is for Mike, and Mike, as you were talking through your presentation, one of the things you mentioned is that um, there really is, an, you know, in this new potential EPA um, legislation and things of that sort, um, there really isn't, you know, is there an opportunity for us, the algae industry, to provide specific language regarding algae as this legislation develops? clean air rule moving forward, a major clean air rule, or two really, if you think about first um, uh, for, uh, for new facilities and second for existing facilities. Moving forward for the first time when biological CO2 technologies are mature and really on the scene. And it will need to be a new, a new conversation that is EPA needs to think about these differently. Up until now, if you look at this, this, this area of the law, that is, what can a utility plant do to reduce CO2 emissions, um, the most cutting edge thinking that you've seen thus far has to do with classical sequestration, which is geological sequestration. 
and uh, and not really with um, bio processes. So I think it's an educational process. To be more specific, in a month or so, in September probably, there's going to be a proposed regulation that comes out. I think that's an opportunity to submit comments uh, uh, formally uh, and perhaps meet with the agency informally to explain the opportunity that's available through, um, if you will, uh, biological sequestration. Uh, to do Mary, it throughout Mary? Can, can you hear me? Hi, Tim. We've had, we have you now. We can Thanks. hear you now. Let's have Hi, Mike Jim. finish answering his question, and then we'll turn it over to you, Tim. Perfect. I'll be brief here. And, uh, and second, with respect to existing technology, same thing. Start to educate the, educate the agency, get these uh, technological options uh, into their thought process, do it both informally and through uh, formal rulemaking. I think it's a great opportunity. I'll end there. Thanks. Great. Now we will turn it over to, to Tim Burns of Bioprocess Algae. Thank you. Mary, hopefully everyone can see the screen in front of you, and I apologize for the audio difficulty. I ended up redialing re in and logging back on. So hopefully uh, you find our presentation on our pathway uh, exciting. Uh, we sure do. Uh, we find it, uh, when we look at it, and we're on an ethanol facility, uh, we like to say it's about monetizing CO2, and if you can monetize the CO2, you really change the equation, and uh, everybody's going to look at their emission a lot differently going forward. So in Shenandoah, we have a, we're on a corn ethanol facility, and we look at it as the fermentation process is getting the last value out of the corn kernel. So uh, thank you for having us. And you're looking at a few pictures. Uh, the first top middle is the ethanol facility we're co-located. The right picture top is a uh, our phase, what we call our phase three, which has been open for a year now, and that's uh, growing and producing algae, uh, looking at the feed, foods, and fuel markets. And down on the left is just a harvest that we I had them take a quick picture coming off of uh, one of the dewatering devices. And then you're looking down one of our reactors in the center picture, and then uh, there's Swetha. Uh, looking at some of the inoculum we grow up and that we feed into the seed stock. So let me move on to the next. Uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, the technology, how we integrate what we think the benefits are, uh, what we've demonstrated at scale, and what our product development path looks like. So I hope you find it interesting. Again, this was uh, what I call phase two that Mary uh, came to the uh, opening with Secretary Vilsack. Uh, we have a about a uh, 10,000 square foot building in which we do inoculum uh, scale up for the farm and the watering and product uh, development labs. So you're looking at the what I call the phase two reactors there uh, and the ethanol facility in the back. Those are about 100 foot reactors, smaller now when you see the new new reactors that we'll take a look at. To us, it's about monetizing carbon. Our technology, we, we kind of look at it and say, how do you flip, always try to flip the equ uh, equation on its head? And what we've done is a lot of energy and a lot of, a lot of capital was being spent trying to bring light into the liquid column. So what we, we work in a uh, attached growth fixed film technology. We said, let's bring the algae to the light. Inherently, you're looking down a uh, reactor of ours, and we're growing in a misted environment with CO2 in the head space. A lot of surface area, so think of it as a big mass transfer device. And we're producing uh, algae there that we harvest and are continually harvesting. So this picture was actually taken in March. It happened to be a snowy day, so I, we got a picture of it, and we thought it was interesting growing year-round. We're using waste heat from the facility, so keep that in mind. When we look at ethanol and the ethanol facility and look at uh, CO2, kind of a you know, one thing we thought of was a nice rule of thumb. Obviously, the big producer utilities and, and such, uh, but the opportunity for algae, you know, is, is enormous. And we look at it as a co-location. Uh, ethanol today represents about 1% of the CO2 stationary sources in the U.S. We believe if you can bring these technologies to bear on these co-locations, it's going to allow a lot of the growing to take place, getting after what we call stranded CO2 or opportunist CO2 and growing platforms. So I had this slide. I thought it was of interest. We put it together. That kind of showed the potential of algae and the potential of, you know, what, what the growth areas could be out there. So when we look at commercial opportunities for CO2 mitigation and reuse, traditional ones are, if you look on the left of the screen, have been carbon capture and sequestration. 
the problem with those, they seem to be, they're not scalable with a cost-effective approach, it seems, at this point. When you look to the right, carbon utilization, that's where algae falls in. We think algae today offers the one profitable path, which I think our platform particularly offers a path of, uh, for a profitable path to using CO2 utilization. So we are really, really supportive of it. You can do it now. You can get efficiencies. You can grow products and probably the most profitable path. It's an autotrophic system. So the way we look at it is it's not going to take all the CO2 in a system, but that first 10 to 30 percent of a system, you could have a profitable pathway and maybe use the remainder to mitigate and have it as a portfolio approach to your CO2 mitigation strategy. Now, if you look down here, our technology platform, what we like about it, the left, as I sh showed you in the earlier picture, you see the ethanol facility in the background. You see our growing and harvesting uh, technology in the, uh, in the forefront. We got our dewatering uh, facility out to the right beyond those reactors. You can see the rooftop up. To us, it's about getting free waste streams input. CO2 is the most costly input when you're growing algae from an operating basis. So by being able to get the utilization out of that, you're, you're getting some advantages in your cost reduction of the product, which this is all to us. How do you get to a profitable path in markets that are of size? So today, we're taking CO2 from the ethanol facility and waste heat coming off of the uh, ethanol facility, which is an added advantage to them because they don't have to run their cooling towers as, as long. So it gives them a cost. It's a cost benefit to GPRA currently. GPRE's facility we're co-located on actually uses brown water coming in from the town, one of only two facilities, ethanol facilities in the U.S. doing that uh, to, for the makeup water for their cooling towers that they run through ultra filters before. We currently have a very high reuse in our water, water system, so we reuse our water, so it's very high reuse. Still looking for nutrients within the ethanol facility, we currently don't have those advantages. Like I said, it's an autotrophic system. Uh, so what we're doing is it's a crop, and we recently had legislation in Iowa that changed that made algae growing in Iowa taxed at the same same rate as corn and soy on a per acre basis, which is a benefit to the industry in that we can scale there and not have prohibitive tax taxes when you're growing a product uh, uh, that that will reach into bigger markets with you know lower average selling prices. What we like about our system is that because we're growing on fixed films, that provide a lot of surface area. We have a higher harvest density. The gas transfer is right in the headspace, so we don't have the cost. We stripped out a lot of the water. We stripped out about 95% of the water. So our harvest density is anywhere from two to eight times other systems out there. It's a direct benefit to the cost of dewatering and, and to the cost of downstream processing. So it gives us some advantages. If you look at the case study of uh, Shenandoah and how Green Plains looks at it, this is getting the value out of the last third of the corn kernel. When they initially, when we formed the company in late 2008 and, and put our first system on in the fall of 2009, we were looking at that point in 2008, 2009, there was going to be potentially a carbon tax. And they were looking at it as, as you know, improving the carbon footprint of the ethanol platform. We've since come to realize that you know, there's a there's a big value equation with growing the algae. So we've continually gone down since 2009 to today on heading towards a path of profitability and demonstrating at scale and increasing the scale. So that's that's how we approach it. So it's getting value. They get a third of the value currently out of their starch, which is the ethanol. They get the protein and fiber, which they get distillers grains and corn oil today. And now they're looking at the algae as getting the last third out of the platform. If you look at this, this is the, uh, our phase three, which is operating. I'll point your attention to the bottom left box. If you look at the black outline, that was our phase two, which had our, has our dewatering and our smaller reactors. Our phase three is on the right, and those are all in operation today. And we have the reactors and, and growing. So that's kind of a Google Earth picture down. And if you go to the, keep going up. And then over, you see the reactors, so it's a finish of construction. And then today, they've been growing and operating for close to a year now. And this is dry product that we have coming off the back of the, uh, the, back of the facility today that we're looking at. So we can produce a, a wet.
wet and a dry product, and that's what that's kind of how we're moving the program forward. Technical metric achievements to date: we've had we've grown algae 70 percent of protein content, and that's uh, pre-delipidated. So figure it'd be about 75 percent if it was delipidated. Oil content through stressing, we've demonstrated you can get it up to uh, 80 percent. We've had very good success with some omega threes. Uh, and growing those out at the facility. And we've grown across multiple seasons, multiple batches, and have met targeted growth paths that we have currently. So this is, uh, one, once again, looking, looking in one of the reactors and one of the, what we like to call biofarmers, uh, looking at the crop and, and probably prior to a harvest. So when we look at the addressable markets, we kind of break them into four buckets, nutritional consumer products, animal feeds, high chemical, uh, high value chemicals and fuels. They all have very strong demand. We are focused primarily in the animal and feeds markets, but have recently uh, been exploring high value chemicals and recently were uh, announced that we, uh, a award we had with the DOE on uh, for upgrade of our uh, growing material for lipids uh, that will be upgraded to jet fuel. So we'll, as, as you approach these markets, we're partnered with GPRE, they're the fourth largest ethanol company, so they're, they're, they understand products at scale, moving products. Some of the smaller markets, when we look at those, when you bring mater large materials, you could potentially crash those markets. So we've been focusing on sustainable proteins as a big market for us. We have a facility, we have actually in the mid coast of uh, Maine, we have two facilities up there and what we, we have is that's our inoculant scale up. So we partner up there with uh, one, of the, one of the labs, National Labs Bigelow, and we also have a biology group we base out of, out of Maine and who we do they grow, grow up and scale up for the inoculant that gets sent out to the farm. If I draw your attention to the picture on the Right, that is uh, omega threes. We grow them in the green or brown, and some of the customers, uh, color is an issue, and with some of those materials. So what we do is we scale up differently. When we look at a big market, an opportunity, we look at fish meal and we look at fish oil. And if you look at what's happened in the fish meal and fish oil markets, those have been static for the uh, fish wild catch have been static for the last 15 years. And it's kind of the price decoupled from soy probably about eight to ten years ago. So it used to track with soy, say in the three hundred, four hundred dollar range about ten years ago. And now it's traveled for the last ten years, it's any been anywhere from twelve hundred to say twenty two hundred dollars a ton. So we look at it as an opportunity to mix with other products, dry distillers, grains, some soy and algae meal and some other additives to provide a sustainable vegetarian, low cost, rich in EPA DHA replacement product. These are some of these uh, products that we currently are growing out there. We grow some with on, in, in depigmatize for some of the customers and this is a comparative with our uh, product for fish meal replacement that we've had and that's a price on the average selling price on a metric ton and the way it's tracked over the last 10, 10 15 years. This was uh, what I mentioned previously. We were awarded in April, announced an uh, award to negotiate for uh, $6.4 million in Shenandoah uh, to increase the facility, uh, demonstrating growing up autotropically and using an integrated biorefinery approach of using ligulinosis sugars to increase the uh, lipid content. De Take the lipids and uh, with our partner groups upgrade those to jet fuel. So we're looking forward to that project which will uh, be beginning in the uh, fall and running uh, over the course of 2014 into 2015. This is who uh, Bioprocess Algae is and who the committed investors are, Green Plains Renewable. They currently have 10 uh, ethanol facilities. They represent close to 10% of the U.S. ethanol production in the U.S. Clarkor has been a uh, partner of ours, is a partner on a water company that I had started. Uh, they're a 100-year-old NYSC company, two to $2.75 billion market cap, very conservatively run. And the Bioholdings is our group. And uh, so we've been committed from the 
beginning, and I might add one of the keys, I think, for companies, and if there are groups that are thinking of starting out there, we've had very committed uh, partners who are really interested in getting to commercial on the path to profit, which is important. And I want to thank you and thank Mary uh, and everybody for uh, allowing us to present uh, our commercial development. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tim, and, and thank you to Mike and to Doug and, and, and for those great presentations. Um, we do have a few questions. I'm going to do the first easy question first. And when the, the first question is um, several people are asking whether the webinar recordings and presentations will be available later. We will be posting this um, at www.algebiomass.org blog um, in the coming days. So yes, they will. So now I need to get into some of the harder questions. Um, and the first one is kind of interesting. I'm not sure to give this to Tim or to Doug. Um, the question is, it appears CO2 will eventually become a saleable and highly commoditized and highly commoditized as algae technologies mature in the coming years. You know, that was obviously seen with Doug's chart where he saw showed all of the markets where that they could sell CO2. At what degree of a cost point do you see CO2 cutting into the development cycle of algae? Um, algal technology players, sorry, my phone was ringing as I was talking to this in my computer. Um, as you know, nothing comes for free and CO2 can't be free. Um, Doug or Tim, is there a point where you know, the cost of CO2 becomes a problem for us to continue this development? Mary, I'd, I'd, I'll, take I'll take a crack at, crack at that crack question at and question. the way we look okay. at it is that I think it will just be part of the business transaction. Uh, you know, if someone has a co-location and they have a free, free waste stream, they're going to look at it. And once you value it, it actually creates some value. So they're going to participate in the farm, in the profits of the farm, in the development, whether it's through they just license the technology or they form a joint venture with, with the development company. And I, that's how I envision how it will roll out uh, over time. Doug, you want to take a, a thought on what, what Duke might think? Sure, I'll take a shot at it. Uh, for a coal fire plant, the flue gas that comes out the stack, 10% uh, of that is CO2. So there is going to be additional energy cost of having to pump that full amount of flue gas to the algae facility. That breaking point is going to be dependent on the actual uh, algae vendor, and, and I can't make that call. Uh, for a natural gas facility, 3% of your flue gas is uh, CO2. So the nice thing that Duke sees with uh, algae is we don't have to go through the expense of separating out the carbon uh, dioxide from the flue gas, which is a very expensive proposition right now with current technology. So the nice thing is we can just send straight flue gas to the uh, algae cultivation and it works just well. As far as the price point, uh, I think that's going to be dependent on, on each algae vendor. Thank you. I have another question for you though, Doug. Uh, Doug, did you hear that question? No, I did. Did not. No, I um. Mary, this is Nate. I think you were offline for just a moment. You could repeat the question now.
Hey, everybody. I think um, uh, Mary may have to uh, rejoin us in a moment. And so what I think I will do is, is um, I take over for a moment. Um, oh, maybe that's her. Mary, are you back with us? No. Um, I think I am. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, I can. Yes, can. Okay, great. Sorry. Sorry. Somehow the audio said it was lost. Okay, so now I have to go back to the question. So this was um, this was regarding build out, and the question was how many algal grow models would it take to sequester all of the demonstration plants CO2? Which I'm sure is a very variable question. <laughs> It is. So depending on the size of the unit, so if the average size, let's say it's five, 600 megawatt unit, it's going to produce around 3 million tons of CO2 a year. Uh, for that size, you're going to have to canvas many, many acres to uh, be able to do that. And I think Tim did a great job on, on indicating that uh, part of the strategy and the way Duke Energy is looking at it is we're trying to find a low cost way to take care of a portion of our CO2 uh, to mitigate our CO2 at a lower cost even before there is a carbon market and then if to meet regulations if they're saying 90 percent removal uh, every hour of the day uh, without a greater than 35 percent increase in cost of electricity to, to meet those kind of requirements we're still going to have to add some other type of post combustion environmental equipment but with algae we're looking at it to take care of a portion of it even before there is a carbon market we had several questions like that under the same vein those I'm sorry, we had several questions like that under the same vein. I am going to sort of group those together and have those answered on our blog, but I have one for Tim. Um, you know, and I think this is interesting because people um, look at your Shenandoah, Iowa plant. Iowa plant. Well, he said, have, have you done, any, done in point the best pseudopatients for the future? Mary, uh, I, um, I can you hear me? Yeah, I, I did. I can't hear you, and I, I, I'm going to repeat back the question if there's anything. Have we mm -hmm. identified the best location for the technology? Yes, for future plants. For future plants. We, we look at it in a, in a way that's kind of interesting and in say if you can grow a tropical in Shenandoah, Iowa, algae, you can grow it anywhere. So we look at it as what's the opportunity there are obviously higher productivity areas based on sunlight, because I have an autotrophic platform. But you have to take into account what are the other circumstances, whether it is what's the temperature in the environment that you're in, what's the co-location opportunities, are they close to markets that you're going to be servicing with some of these materials. And you have we are very driven by techno-economic modeling in our platform, and we kind of continually revert back the modeling. So we look at the ethanol facilities, and I'll tell you because they have a pure CO2 stream as a great, great first facility, or, or I should say, first avenue before, such as a utility, which we have look at as a next stop to go into. But it, it offers a great. They understand co-products, which we are a big believer in co-products of the uh, for the economic modeling and they understand moving products at scale in commodity commodity industries. So we think the ethanol offers a good first mover advantage for us. Thank you. I have one last question. Um, and actually, I'm going to put this one over to Mike at K&L Gates. Um, Geosequestration versus biosequestration, carbon capture versus carbon utilization or reuse. All great terms in creating algal technology awareness. Is there an initiative to adopt common nomenclature to influence policy, investment, and, pol and public support? Thank you, Mary. 
I don't think that there's a formal initiative, but I do think that there should be at least an informal one. I think, for example, that I think that carbon utilization is a great term. I love I, I, I loved uh, hearing that in Tim's presentation. Uh, and again, if you a lot of this is educating people who will be our allies once they think it through. If you read the president's climate plan, when they're talking about spurring investment in advanced fossil energy projects, they then say that, that this is uh, th this goes to, quote, innovative technologies, including the avoidance, reduction, or sequestration of carbon. And that just sounds like, if you will, the old language that doesn't take carbon utilization, biological sequestration into account. And so I think that it's an education process, uh, kind of sharpening the language, uh, all of the above. I, I have to agree with you. I know that we and our team here at ABO have been really trying to make sure that we use as often as we can and where it's appropriate the words beneficial reuse. Um, that being said, we're at the top of the hour. Um, so we do have other questions and we will be answering these questions um, via our blog and on the website. Um, we appreciate um, the questions that have been submitted. Um, and if you have any other questions, please submit it to um, info at algaebiomass.org. Um, also, if you enjoyed today's webinar, um, please give us some feedback on what you would like to see in the future. We'd like to do six to eight webinars like this a year. Um, but I would be remiss, um, I have to put my executive director's hat on, that um, consider joining us at the 7th Annual Algae Biomass Summit in Orlando in September. Um, September 30th to October 3rd. We have more than 100 speakers, 100 poster presentations, great networking. It's in a beautiful location at a beautiful time of the year. Um, it's going to be packed with technical briefings, roundtable discussions, poster presentations, and as I said before, great networking events. Um, you can always go to algobiomasssummit.org to get more information, but um, and we also just um, announced tours, um, a more fun tour on on Monday um, with the Daytona Speedway and the Kennedy Space Center with Daytona. We're going to be talking about some of their green energy initiatives. And on Thursday, um, one of our members, Algenol, has um, decided, um, has graciously decided to open up their facility um, and show the technology that they're doing with algae to ethanol. Um, last, I'd like to thank our panelists again. Um, and I want to thank the 160 plus people that joined us today, and um, and thank you for participating in today's webinar. And if you're at the DOE Biomass Conference next week, I hope to see you there. Thank you. <laughs>